Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Wednesday, everybody. First up, a PRC spacecraft carrying samples collected on the far side of the moon returned to Earth yesterday, Tuesday, an important milestone for China's lunar exploration. The Chang'e 6 spacecraft touched down on Inner Mongolia, a province within the PRC, grasslands at around 2 p.m. local time. Scientists believe the samples could answer key questions about how planets are formed. It is also hoped it will contain traces of ice. China is the only country to have landed on the far side of the moon, which is technically challenging to reach, having done so before in 2019. General Secretary Xi Jinping called to congratulate those at the command center of the Chang'e 6 mission, expressing that he hopes that they can carry out exploring deep space and quote reaching new heights in unraveling the mysteries of the universe to benefit humanity and advance the nation. End quote. The Chang'e 6 blasted off from a space center in early May, which we covered at the time. The mission lasted 53 days. This is a technological achievement for Beijing and a public relations win for its patriotic domestic audience. It is also another step forward in a new space race, this time between the U.S. and China. The success advances China's plan to put astronauts on the moon by 2030 and build a lunar base by 2035. U.S.-based Wall Street Journal writes today that such momentum is worrying American space officials and lawmakers who have their own ambitions to build moon bases. Unlike the original space race between the Americans and the Soviets, the Allied ads, the goal of the U.S. and China isn't just to make a short trip to the moon. Quote, It is to build permanent human outposts on its most strategic location, the lunar South Pole, and as both nations gear up to build stations there one day, it is looking likely that tensions in orbit will mirror those on Earth. End quote. NASA's Artemis exploration program plans to conduct multiple landings in the coming years. Develop a logistics station in lunar orbit, and eventually build permanent camps on the moon's surface. Some U.S. officials fear China is planning a land grab. Chinese officials suspect the same of the Americans, and are teaming up with Russia for its South Pole outpost. In 2021, China and Russia signed an agreement to build a research base on the lunar South Pole. Thus, the growing spheres of influence in geopolitical competition on Earth will be reflected. In this new space race. Next up, we move、uh, to a competition much more dangerous and closer to home, with an update to the growing tensions around the Second Thomas Shoal in the South China Sea. We remember recent weeks saw a violent clash between Chinese and Philippine Coast Guard vessels. Last week also saw the publication of reports saying that the Philippines had been secretly delivering construction materials to the Sierra Madre ship, causing angry responses from Beijing. Another response was from state media. State-run Global Times reported that actually Beijing had known this for a while and posted videos allegedly showing construction materials arriving hidden on fishing boats. This week, President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. flew with his top generals and defense chief to the western island province of Palawan. Which faces the South China Sea to meet and award medals to naval personnel who came under assault by the Chinese Coast Guard last Monday during the resupply mission. Marcos told Filipino forces, quote, "We are not in the business to instigate wars. In defending the nation, we stay true to our Filipino nature, and we would like to settle all these issues peacefully." End quote. The defense secretary told a media briefing, quote, "We are not downplaying the incident." We see the latest incident not as a misunderstanding or an accident. It is a deliberate act of the Chinese officialdom to prevent us from completing our mission. End quote. He added that the Philippines will continue to resupply its troops stationed on the rusting warship grounded on Second Thomas Shoal, but it will not publicize schedules of these missions. The People's Republic of China Foreign Ministry hit back against the comment the same day, expressing, "Quote: The Philippines should stop making provocations and infringing on China's sovereignty, and work with China to uphold peace and stability in the South China Sea." End quote. Meanwhile, Hong Kong-based South China Morning Post reports that the Philippines' installation of an anti-ship missile base facing the South China Sea marks, "quote, a quantum leap in its defenses." And will give Beijing pause, even as Manila remains outmatched by China's superior military might. Naval Defense News website Naval News 
reported earlier this month that satellite imagery shows the Southeast Asian nation's first BrahMos anti-ship missile base taking shape on the west coast of Luzon Island. India delivered the first batch of the missiles to the Philippines in April under a 335 million US dollar deal the two signed back in 2022. Malcolm Davis, a senior defense analyst at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute think tank, said establishing a land-based anti-ship missile capability offers the Philippines a notable deterrence boost against China. Telling the South China Morning Post, quote, it represents a significant jump in Manila's ability to hold at risk Chinese naval assets within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone and act as a deterrent to further aggression from Beijing by raising risk and potential cost. Beijing may be dissuaded from undertaking provocations in the future, end quote. Next up, we move to the Chinese economy, but first a sponsored feature disseminated on behalf of American Salaz Lithium. With the fragmentation of global order, Washington and other industrialized capitals around the world recognize the importance of bringing critical supply chains and mining operations back home. This is especially the case with lithium. The International Energy Agency forecasts that soaring EV battery demand alone will require 50 new lithium projects by 2030. There is currently one in the United States. This means that there will be acute demand in the Americas for lithium going forward. And that's where today's video sponsor, American Solars Lithium, provides an excellent opportunity for savvy investors looking to take advantage of these historic shifts. American Solars Lithium is currently focused on lithium projects in North and South America, with multiple projects in Argentina and the United States of America. The company's primary focus is the expansion and development of its Argentina-based Basicos 1 and Candala 2 lithium brine projects. This is where the big opportunity is. By accumulating projects at distressed prices, American Salaz Lithium is building an attractive portfolio of lithium assets in the Americas. They are betting that the supply chain shifts and future lithium price projections will pay off. And if it does pay off, then their capital value will surge with it. Their Pasitos 1 and Kandala 2 projects both already have defined lithium resources and are surrounded by other major lithium companies, which on paper are worth over 5 billion US dollars at current lithium carbonate prices. Being Brian projects, they are quicker to build resources and more environmentally friendly. The leadership is strong too. Christopher Copper, a director of Alpha Lithium, which sold for over 300 million US dollars, has joined the board recently, betting big on the company's success, and recently welcomed another Alpha Lithium alumni country manager, David Guerrero Elvarado, an Argentina businessman who has joined the advisory board. The company has only 28,800,000 shares outstanding, tightly held stock, with which, up to recently, has been thinly traded. These mining companies make up the speculative part of a well-diversified portfolio. Some risks, but also room for potentially high returns. So if you're looking for this kind of opportunity, consider looking into American Salaz Lithium. We remember that all investment involves risk. This sponsored feature is not individual investment advice. Always speak to an investment professional and do your own due diligence before making any investment decision. A big thank you to American Salaz Lithium for sponsoring this episode of China Update. Now we return to regular coverage. Next up, in December last year, China's Central Economic Work Conference proposed the first reforms to the country's 30-year-old fiscal and taxation system, sparking widespread debate among academics and tax experts. The recommendations and reactions to them underscore the urgency for change amid current budget challenges and record local government debt. This week, Chinese financial media outlet Tsai Xin published a long, in-depth piece discussing this very topic. The outlet writes that the health of the fiscal and taxation system is crucial for economic stability and growth. Quote, and reforming these systems is essential for sustaining development and enhancing the effectiveness of governance. End quote. Policy advisors say that changes must balance the competing needs to boost tax revenue while reducing the tax burden on businesses and allowing local governments to retain more revenue to lower their reliance on the central government for funding. Now let's examine some excerpts from this report, which we are now quoting selected parts from directly. The proposed reforms come as China grapples with a sluggish post-pandemic economic recovery and slower growth of government income as a result of tax and fee cuts and loss of land sale revenue. 
In 2023, national fiscal revenue reached 21.7 trillion yuan, 2.98 trillion US dollars, marking an increase of only 2.7% from 2019. Income from land auctions plummeted to 5.8 trillion yuan from the 2021 peak of 8.7 trillion yuan. The resulting fiscal strain has led to public bus service suspensions and unpaid salaries for civil servants in some regions. Among China's 18 tax categories, VAT, value-added tax, is the largest, contributing 6.93 trillion yuan in 2022, accounting for 38.3% of total tax revenue. Corporate income tax follows, generating 4.11 trillion yuan. Stabilizing these revenue sources is essential for maintaining the overall tax burden. With declining land revenue and limited alternative sources, experts suggest the need to increase the scale of government debt financing. China's local government debt already surpasses national borrowings, with the outstanding balance of local government debt reaching 40.74 trillion yuan at the end of 2023, compared to 30.03 trillion yuan in national debt. Another key element of the proposed reforms is to adjust the fiscal relationship between different levels of governments, especially between the central and local governments. In 2023, local revenue accounted for 54% of the nation's total government receipts, but local expenditures represented 86% of public expenditures as local authorities shoulder a wider range of expenditures, including payrolls for public servants, spending for transit and construction of hospitals, schools and other urban developments. We end our direct quoting here. And we finish with one further observation on this debate. Quote, Much of the reform discussions focus on splitting responsibilities between local government and the central government, and on ways to raise total funding without undermining domestic demand, especially business and household demand. One major problem that I don't think is being addressed is the difference between formal and informal tax revenues. While formal tax revenues in China are low, the Chinese economy in past decades has been driven by large implicit transfers from households in the form of repressed interest rates, directed credits, weak labor rights, and undervalued currency, overspending on manufacturing, logistic and infrastructure, etc., to subsidize what is in effect fiscal support for manufacturing and government investment. These implicit transfers don't show up on any accounts as tax revenues and fiscal expenditures but they are basically the same thing. Government mandated transfers from households to pay for various fiscal objectives. Ultimately, these transfers have to be reversed if China is going to rebalance towards a higher role for domestic consumption, but that just makes the tax reform process in China that much more difficult. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Have a good Wednesday, and I will see you all tomorrow.